Hey everybody, welcome to the May 26th uh, MakerDAO community call. My name is David Utrobin. I work uh, doing community development here at the Maker Foundation. Uh, also longtime community member and a uh, huge Maker fan. Uh, I'm gonna post in the chat the agenda for the call. Uh, I prepare the agenda, you know, day before, a couple days before every week. Uh, and typically we go through uh, what's happening in MakerDAO with regards to governance, uh, with regards to uh, the partnerships and integrations, uh, any any partnerships and integrations around DAI, uh, around Maker Vaults, et cetera. Uh, I go through uh, recent posts from the Maker blog, highlights from the community, everything from uh, interesting articles. Uh, I've seen uh, developer creations, uh, videos, presentations. We have a couple this week. Uh, and then I also, uh, uh, I also talk about a few of the real life events that are going on uh, within the week. So, uh, so also sometimes we have uh, we have guests on the call. I actually believe that what is it next week? Next week is the second. Yeah. So next week, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna mention this again uh, towards the end of the call. But next week we're gonna be participating in Dow Rush. Uh, which is uh, kind of like a week of uh, calls in the crypto space around DAOs and uh, be becoming more familiar with the human side of the DAO. Uh, and so MakerDAO obviously is uh, filled with a ton of uh, passionate and motivated people that uh, have been working to build up the Maker protocol uh, to have DAI kind of fulfill the vision that was set out, you know, all those years ago. What was it like five years ago now? No. Yeah, something, something like that. Well, I should probably know that better. But either way, uh, yeah, so ne next week is going to be interesting. We're, we're actually going to be, uh, actually, screw it. I'll tell you guys the format. We're going to be doing like a brief introduction of MakerDAO because uh, we expect like uh, several people from, uh, from kind of the crypto community who don't usually come to these calls to come. So we're going to do like a bit of an introduction. We're going to tour through some of like the venues and interfaces where things happen. Uh, so like if you were to participate in the DAO, where would you vote? Where would you talk to other members of the DAO? Uh, how are issues kind of handled and discussed? Uh, we're going to present, well, I'm going to present uh, a handful of initiatives and major changes that happened in maybe like the last six months to a year, mostly with the launch of MCD uh, that have been led by the community. Uh, so, you know, the Maker Foundation is definitely a huge part of uh, bootstrapping the protocol, but we have seen a ton of, uh, of kind of grassroots led initiatives uh, and changes made to the protocol by the community. Uh, so we're gonna be covering a few of those. And then finally, like towards the end of the call, we're gonna do two or three like mini interviews with some active community members. I think uh, Hexanaut, Long for Wisdom, and uh, maybe a couple more people are gonna be on the call. So we're gonna do that and have some Q and A. Uh, so definitely join next week, same time. Uh, and it's gonna be a pretty fun call. Uh, all right, cool. So there was my shameless plug for next community call. Uh, if, uh, if anybody wants to uh, stop me, ask questions, feel free to type in the chat. Uh, I'm happy to read out your comments. If you have a, uh, if you have a uh, microphone, feel free to jump on the microphone. Uh, totally happy to, uh, to engage in discussion. Uh, so yeah, without further ado, I think I'm gonna go ahead and share a part of my screen and uh, and go through the agenda because there is a lot of interesting stuff that is happening. And I'm gonna just move zoom to my left monitor and share my screen here. Huh. This is odd. Oh, there it is. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, uh, I assume you guys could see my screen, but uh, you know, tell me if you can't. Uh, and also, I just want to open this up so that I could see. The you chat. can see it. All right, cool. Thanks. Uh, all right. Sorry. Give me one second, because I want to make sure that I could uh, still let people in if they're in the waiting room. All right, I think we should be good. All right, cool. Uh, all right, so 
Uh, let's get into governance first. So uh, a few TLDRs. Uh, this week, uh, we have an executive vote uh, that is live right now, and uh, it's actually ending, I think, on uh, Thursday. Yeah, Thursday, four days. Uh, so it's to ratify MIP0 uh, subproposal, uh, well, uh, component 12 subproposal two. So uh, if you're interested in like what, what all this uh, crazy notation means, uh, you can go into uh, the MIPS uh, uh, GitHub repo and, and read a little bit about it. But uh, basically this is uh, C12 is the process for onboarding uh, new personnel into like giving people official positions in the DAO. And so this is the first example of that. And it's the onboarding of Long for Wisdom as the second uh, official governance facilitator. Uh, as many of you know, the first was uh, Richard Brown, uh, and he definitely did uh, uh, did a ton of work uh, pioneering that role. And uh, and he uh, nominated Long for Wisdom to be uh, the first community uh, elected and uh, rat you know, hopefully by the end of this week ratified governance facilitator. So if you're an MKR uh, holder, uh, definitely go vote. Uh, whether you're for or against long. Uh, but uh, I wanted to point out that, what did I want to point out here? Actually, yeah, that's about it. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested in reading more about this, I added some links down below. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so I guess I'll move on to the next point. So a series, uh, oh yeah, so this week, a series of community green light polls are running to approve domain work on various uh, MIP6 collateral onboarding applications. Uh, yeah, MIP6 is the process outlined by the MIPS framework for collateral onboarding. And we've actually had, uh, as you can see, uh, quite a few collateral applications in the last uh, month and a half or so. Uh, so the community green light polls are meant to uh, approve uh, further domain work on each of the collaterals. So uh, maker holders can essentially say, yeah, you know, smart contracts team, uh, Oracle team, uh, what's the other? What are the other teams, David? Uh, all the all of the domain teams. You can uh, you can kind of give your review about this collateral uh, before it launches into the further stages of being considered for onboarding. So, uh, yeah. So this week is the first instance of that. Uh, I'm gonna get into. I can. I'm gonna kind of like scroll through these. Uh, I added links to the collateral application, and also I probably should have just added one of these. But if you're interested in uh, the actual uh, process of community greenlight polls, you could read MIP9 here. Uh, and also I linked to the actual polls themselves. So if, uh, if you would like to, you could just click on those and make your votes. So, so yeah, uh, next point. Yeah, I'm just gonna go through these uh, top points first and then I'll kind of go through the rest of the doc. So uh, right now we're in the beginning of week four, the final week of the first governance cycle. So the beginning of this month marked the very first governance cycle. Uh, and for the first three months, uh, there's actually this kind of transition period where things aren't uh, going exactly 100% uh, uh, in the way that the MIP processes uh, lay out that it should, because we're still transitioning from the old way of doing things uh, to the new. So there is a bit of flexibility for these next three months as we solidify uh, all these processes and uh, and kind of really fully embrace uh, this new world with MIPS. So we're at the end of uh, the first governance cycle and you could read about the governance cycle in MIP3. And actually I will, uh, I'll add a link there after the call. Uh, another interesting news, uh, the stability fee structure has been, uh, a change has been voted in. Uh, so this week is the first uh, base rate vote as well as the uh, vote for the DSR spread, which is now based off of the base rate. So if you don't know about this, uh, before this week, we would uh, vote for a number of stability fees in kind of uh, an odd format. So we used to vote for uh, the ETH and BAT stability fees under uh, the question of what should the DAI stability fee be. And then we would individually vote for uh, the other vault type stability fees like USDC, WBTC, uh, uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, and so uh, this obviously doesn't scale. It, it causes a ton of uh, weekly votes. Uh, so Sam M uh, did a proposal. Uh, I think, uh, was it structured as a MIP? I think, uh, I don't think it was actually. 
Uh, I, I should probably know that, but uh, but there is a lot <laughs> to cover, so forgive me. But uh, but either way, you guys could definitely read a bit a bit about it. But uh, the basic idea is that now the base rate is going to be kind of the universal rate for all of the. Uh, yeah, Juan says, uh, I think it was a MIP. Yeah, I'll, I'll link it if, if, I, if I find it after the call. But uh, but yeah, so the base rate is basically the, uh, uh, yeah, exactly what it sounds like, uh, the uh, base rate for all vault types across the board. Uh, and then in addition to that, uh, maker voters will vote on, uh, uh, I think it was called a, uh, well, it, the idea is it's a risk premium. So it's like an additional rate that's added on top. Uh, uh, that's based specifically on uh, the type of vault itself. Uh, so for example, uh, actually I'm gonna talk about it in this next point, but uh, USDC-B, uh, which is a short-term uh, liquidity vault, which uh, is not meant to be used for long-term, uh, will actually, is being proposed with a 50% stability fee. So uh, if the base rate, uh, which currently is 0%, uh, it stays at 0%, then USDCB will be 50% because, uh, yeah, it's base rate plus uh, plus that risk premium. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm kind of getting into a little bit of weeds here because the 50% stability fee for the USDCB vault is uh, goes a little bit beyond being there just for the risk premium. It's actually there uh, to, uh, to be kind of an emergency liquidity facility for keepers that are participating in auctions during times of like very high volumes of auctions. Uh, so, but yeah, I will cover that in a bit. But either way, the stability fee structure uh, has been voted in and this week uh, is the first kind of uh, base rate vote. So we will see how that shakes out. Uh, Give me one second. I think somebody might be asking for the password. Yeah, here it is. Uh, oh no. Yeah, there it is. Okay, cool. I hope I do see the waiting list. All right, anyway. So a proposed USDCB vault type has been included in this round of governance polls. The community had been talking about uh, this uh, second USDC vault type for quite a while. Uh, the first USDC vault type was meant to be this in a, in a, in a sense because it was initially onboarded uh, to provide that die liquidity during a time where there was a die liquidity crunch as a result of March 12th and, uh, and like just tons of liquidated uh, positions uh, and huge surge in demand for die. So USDCB, uh, is a vault type that, uh, and you could actually look at the parameters uh, in the vote down here. Uh, and also just for posterity, I'm gonna repost the, uh, the link here for anybody who joined late. Uh, but yeah, so actually maybe we could just jump in here real quick and uh, go over those uh, those parameters. but. Okay, this is taking a little bit to load. Up, oh, all right, cool. So yeah, so it, it's gonna be, it's being proposed with a stability fee of 50%, a debt ceiling of 10 million, liquidation ratio of 120%, uh, and then kind of uh, the uh, standard parameters for auctions uh, as they pertain uh, to like ETH, BAT, and uh, yeah, all, pretty much the standard auctions. Uh, and this is mostly because liquidations are actually turned off for USDC vault types uh, by default at the moment. Uh, the liquidation penalty is uh, set at the standard 13%. Uh, and like all the other vaults, there's a minimum uh, die generation uh, amount of 20 die. And that's to prevent spam vaults, uh, people just from opening tons of uh, very small vaults. Uh, all right, yeah. And then the last uh, kind of TLDR point I wanted to bring up is that three MIPS, 13, 14, and 15, which I'll talk about a little bit uh, later, uh, have been submitted on the forums and are in the request for comment phase. And this is a phase which lasts for three months. So uh, I added the links to those forum threads down below. And you, uh, if you are interested, uh, definitely comment any concerns, feedback, uh, and things you would like to see clarified in those MIPS. All right, so uh, let me kind of run through these. Yeah, executive vote, that's uh, 
going on. It's going to expire in four days. So if it doesn't pass, uh, Long for Wisdom will still have a chance for uh, resubmitting and trying to be elected again. Uh, but as part of uh, the process outlined in MIPS, uh, this specific executive vote, uh, which happens in the fourth week of the governance cycle, which is this week, uh, has to be passed within four days. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's null and void. Uh, and it's actually kind of hard coded in there. And uh, I, th I hope I linked it down below, but uh, our team did some interesting stuff in uh, coding up this executive vote. Uh, I can cover it later if I see it in my document. Uh, yeah, so all of these are, uh, let me just kind of get to the bottom of them. E yeah, here. So all of these right here are the community green light polls. Uh, and basically if you vote yes, you think that it's worth for uh, the current domain teams to uh, do further uh, review and post their assessments about these collaterals uh, for the community to kind of read and consider. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of the first instance of that. I already talked a bit about it, so I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, at the moment, there's actually uh, a, an accelerated track for... Oh, give me one second. So Akiva is saying that, David, I think the dates are wrong in your document. On the voting page, it says that there's 12 days left. Uh-huh. Yeah, so uh, this there was there is a little bit of confusion. I think that uh, the community green light polls actually, haha. Look, lucky for you, Charles actually just messaged me. So I think, uh, I think in about a minute or two, I'm going to ask him to clarify because he could probably do it a bit better for me than me. Uh, and Mark is asking, what's the current bottleneck uh, for a governance poll for Lend? Uh, for Lend? I'm not, I'm not actually sure. Uh, I could uh, I could check it out right now while we wait for Charles, but uh, uh, I'm asking the question because we we did the collateral application approximately at the same time that the other. Yeah, so. here here it is. So so the lend application. I think so. There was a number of uh, of domain green lights that are due. So the smart con you know the Oracle team posted. Uh, like, let me see if I can find an example, but uh, the Oracle team posted, for example, uh, this kind of uh, onboarding evaluation for a number of the, uh, of the applications. I think that it's just a, a backlog issue, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, yeah. yeah. And no issue, it will be in the next batch, I guess. No issue at all. Hopefully. Uh, yeah, it just looks like it's a it's a backlog issue mostly. But I'm again, I might I might be wrong. Uh, Thanks a lot. No worries. All right, cool. So so yeah, so if you're interested, I could actually uh, post this here, uh, and any of you guys could bookmark or gals can bookmark uh, this page and and kind of use it to see the current status of any uh, collateral applications. Uh, all right, so. While Charles is on the way here, I'm going to address the uh, two week versus three day thing because I, I, I'm not sure <laughs> if, if I'm right or wrong, but uh, Charles will have a, a way better uh, explanation. And the reason why I'm not sure is, is because when I read MIP 9, it says that the community green light polls are supposed to last for, uh, uh, for basically five days, like from Monday to Friday of the fourth week. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll wait for Charles to come in. He should be here in a bit. Uh, all right, so, so yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, there is a accelerated track happening for onboarding TUSD as a collateral type. Uh, some of the domain work has already been done. And as part of this three month uh, period uh, where we're in this transition period. Uh, the domain teams have a, uh, a lot more flexibility to kind of work on the collateral that they think uh, has the best sentiment from the community and, uh, and has kind of by their judgment, uh, the most appropriate level of priority. So at the moment, there is a ton of desire in the community for uh, diversifying the stable coin side of the collateral portfolio. Uh, and as part of that diversification, uh, TSD is being uh, is being uh, 
proposed as a collateral type. Uh, and actually, I think uh, I think there's some risk parameters in here that I could cover really quickly. Uh, but yeah, obviously, this is still going to have to go through a final executive vote before before the actual vault is created. Uh, but these are just the risk parameters that are the recommendations from the risk team. Uh, so yeah, a 0% stability fee, uh, a small debt ceiling, 2 million, a uh, liquidation ratio of 120%, uh, the standard auction uh, parameters. I wonder if that's standard. I remember there being a six day auction duration. Uh, and then yeah, the standard dust and liquidation penalties. <clears throat> and uh, and you know the reason for small debt ceiling uh, is because of uh, the, uh, I believe the, the market assessment of TUSD, it's, it's not very liquid. It, it doesn't have too many users, but in general, this is kind of the recommended debt ceiling so far. So if you're a maker holder, definitely jump in and vote as you can see. Uh, some people are for, some people are against, but nevertheless, it's, uh, uh, yeah, that's what's happening this week. Uh, so the governance facilitator determined that we should also put up a community green light poll uh, based on kind of just the regular process, how it came through. Also in the possible situation that, uh, that this uh, poll does not get voted in this week, uh, we could then revert to the regular MIPS standard process and continue like the others. So. Uh, so we're still having a community green light poll uh, for TUSD uh, just to stay true to the MIPS process. Uh, all right. So yeah, I mentioned this before, but add USDCB as a collateral type uh, already went into a bit of that. Uh, yeah, the base rate vote and the die savings rate spread adjustment vote. So, uh, so yeah, if anybody has questions about that, feel, feel free to, to jump on, but I think I covered it. Uh, enough. Uh, a summary of last Thursday's risk and governance call is on the way. It's going to be posted to the forums uh, later tonight. Uh, so look out for that. Uh, there were a couple of really interesting pr uh, presentations on last week's uh, risk and governance call. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about them uh, in like five, 10 minutes when I get there. Uh, so some, some links from uh, governance at a glance. Oh no, I actually didn't post MIP 14 and 13 here, but uh, I thought I did, but it's okay. I'm gonna post the links here after. Uh, but yeah, MIP, MIP 13 is actually uh, the declarations of intent MIP. Actually, I could really quickly link it, haha. -ha. So this is a, a, a process MIP that basically gives uh, governance the ability to almost like produce a bounty. Like, all right, we intend to pay X amount for X service from X person. Uh, and obviously like, that, that's a super simplified way of uh, putting it, but uh, definitely kind of step one to uh, a very important part of the process uh, for governance. Let me just edit on the fly. All right, and then uh, MIP 14 is actually uh, a MIP for die pro uh, for transferring die through the Maker protocol, uh, and this is kind of also this uh, this foundational idea for you know how does the how does the DAO pay for services? Like right now, uh, the Maker Foundation is primarily you know uh, spending. Uh, it's money on bootstrapping uh, the ecosystem, paying people uh, and subsidizing uh, the growth of the protocol. But eventually as the protocol becomes self-sustaining, uh, there needs to be a process defined for actually uh, transferring DAI to a specified Ethereum address uh, that is from the protocol. Uh, all right, here, all right. I'm letting Charles in, but I think several people are having like these connectivity issues where like I let people in a couple times, but for some reason it like kicks kicks you out for unclear reasons. All right, cool. So, uh, so yeah, so these are the three MIPS that are in the request for uh, comment phase. This phase again lasts for three months. So uh, if you're interested. Uh, definitely comment on these threads. Uh, I have no doubt in my mind that there will uh, probably be some presentations around these two. 
maybe not. But uh, this week, last Thursday, there was a presentation on the dark spell mechanism, which uh, if you don't know what that is, it's basically a process for addressing any critical bugs in the maker protocol uh, while kind of <laughs> not revealing the, uh, the bug fix uh, in the code. Like, so there's a problem because any executive vote that's passed has to wait for uh, wait through a delay period that is uh, defined in the governance security module. And the reason for the delay period is so that if there is a governance attack, uh, MKR uh, holders can have a chance to uh, emergency shut down the system or uh, basically remedy that malicious attack. So at the moment, there's a, I believe, six hour delay. Uh, and so if there is a critical vulnerability and an executive vote is uh, crafted and placed into the system, even if it passes right away, it's going to be, you know, the, the code in there is, is, is open for anybody to see. So people would be able to presumably uh, or potentially reverse engineer the exploit and carry it out before the fix actually happens. So this is a, a bit of a workaround. It involves uh, electing trusted parties uh, to kind of vouch for the bug fix. And it, uh, and it also uh, kind of outlines the way that the bug fix can be uh, put out there uh, in a non-publicly visible way. So uh, obviously there's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of kind of uh, philosophical depth to this issue. Uh, it introduces trusted parties. It, uh, it obviously is not an easy thing to deal with, uh, but uh, it's, it's necessary, right? So uh, obviously, well, I don't wanna say obviously, but uh, the intention is to uh, refine this process, to make it better, to make it uh, as trustless as possible, but uh, ultimately, this is kind of the first iteration of dealing with critical vulnerabilities as a DAO. Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. All right, cool. So I mentioned, uh, yeah, this is the forum post for, for the USDCB proposal. Uh, there's also a discussion happening to add governance met metadata to uh, proposals. Uh, so kind of in, uh, in the form of uh, on-chain attestation, uh, if I'm not mistaken, because I didn't actually read through this entire thread. Uh, I just kind of skimmed through it. Uh, but the interesting thing is uh, for the executive vote that's happening uh, currently, uh, there is a hash in there of the entire proposal. So, uh, uh, so there is some on-chain on attestation already happening, uh, which is pretty exciting. Uh, also, if you, uh, if uh, you haven't heard already, uh, there is a forum poll happening right now that expires on May 31st, uh, and it is to approve or disapprove the maker source cred trial. Uh, if you don't know what source cred is, it's a really interesting project. It basically uh, measures activity in a given community, uh, and it rewards it with, uh, with uh, at the moment, cred. Uh, but basically, it rewards people with uh, with monetary compensation, uh, and it's it's a really clever uh, design. The Thursday governance call had uh, had a nice presentation from Dandelion Main, uh, who's the product uh, who's the uh, product lead there or the project lead? I think it's he's the product lead. Uh, but we are uh, they had proposed a three month trial. Uh, to use or to integrate source cred into the uh, forum.makerdao.com uh, forum. Yeah, I said they, I didn't say he. Uh, Dandelion, yeah, uh, they done. Uh, so yeah, so the maker source cred trial lasts for uh, three months and the intention I believe is to distribute, uh, I think 5,000 or 15,000 die. Where is that number? I think it's down here. This is a pretty big thread. Uh, yeah, so here, they're gonna run the trial for three months distributing at least 5K worth of dye each month. So it's a $15,000 uh, experiment. And uh, basically it rewards people on the forum who contribute uh, to successful governance actions. And uh, of course, my explanations don't do this thing justice. I highly suggest you check out the uh, the presentation from uh, last Thursday's governance call. 
All right, and then also uh, for uh, a better framed weekly MIPS update than mine, uh, go on the forum and check out uh, Charles's update. He posts this update, uh, or I think he updates it. Uh, Charles is actually on the call. He can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I believe he updates this thread every week. You don't post a new thread, right? Yeah, I've yeah, been posting yeah. it uh, a new one each week. I mean, I okay. could ultimately just update that thread, but then the history wouldn't be preserved. I gotcha. Yeah, no worries, no worries. All right, cool. Yeah, so then uh, it's going to be a weekly MIPS update, fresh form post. And this is the one from uh, this past week. Uh, and also, Charles, since, since you're here, there was one thing that uh, we wanted clarity on. Uh, so the community green light polls, uh, the, they're supposed to last, I, I read in MIP9 that they last from the fourth Monday to the fourth Friday, but I know that there is something going on with having them last for two weeks. Can you, can you unpack that? Yeah. So unfortunately there are a couple inconsistencies written in MIP9. Uh, in a few places it states that the CUNY polls will run for two weeks. And then in one section it states that, um, it will be from the, the fourth Monday to the, the fourth Friday. However, uh, the actual decision that was meant to be consistent in there is that they'd last for two weeks. And the thought process behind this is that the two week period gives people that aren't as necessarily active in governance, um, they kind of check in every, every week or um, not, not, they're not constantly monitoring governance and the maker chat. So it gives them the chance to vote and provide, also provide other community members to provide forum updates or do any kind of uh, updates on calls with respect to the outcomes and what needs kind of prioritizing if people actually feel they want to get that collateral greenlit. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, we may propose an amendment to MIP9 to make the uh, community greenlight polls last for the two the, the last two weeks of the governance cycle as opposed to just mm -hmm. two weeks starting in the last week of the governance cycle. Um, so this would help it um, better flow with the governance cycle and um, how uh, MIPS are onboarded through Claro onboarding. So yeah, it, it is two weeks. Um, unfortunately, there was an error in the MIP, but we're gonna work to make an amendment to fix that up and clarify it. Right on, thanks. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Yeah, it makes a lot more sense to do it from week two to week four, so it all kind of fits into a single governance cycle. So yeah. over these two weeks, uh, people are voting yes or no, uh, basically to tell the uh, the domain teams, you know, kind of giving them the green light or not to work on a given, uh, uh, given domain work uh, and to post their evaluations about a given proposed collateral type, right? Uh, so during those two weeks is the, is like, um, at the end of the two weeks when all of these polls conclude, uh, is it that there's basically a priority list that's based on the amount of maker that was voted yes for each or how does that work? Yeah, so as of now, I mean, with the results of the, the community greenlight polls, you'll see the um, discrepancy between the yes and no kind of hopefully help shape the priority of them. In general, the community greenlight polls are just serving the, the purpose of being this strong signal from the community on which collateral assets, collateral types, um, the community has strong feelings towards and getting onboarded. So the domain teams would then use the, these signals as a way to decide what next to uh, work on and build up the requirements to then bundle up together and make a MIP-12 proposal to add that collateral type and it would then be added to the maker protocol once I guess the, the final exec would go at the end of that month. Got it, got it. Sweet. All right, let me get back to where we were. Yeah, thank you so much, Charles. And by the way, anybody, if you're on the call and you have like uh, further questions about MIPS, definitely join us on, uh, on the MIPS channel in Rocket Chat uh, or on the forums or, uh, you know, definitely feel free to jump in now and ask any questions. Charles is, oh, oops, wrong person. Charles is a, a wonderful resource. He's, uh, he's one of the people that actually uh, very thoughtfully and uh, meticulously created and, and uh, was integral to kind of the creation of the whole MIPS process at Maker. 
All right. So. Yeah, and also feel free to uh, DM me. I mean, obviously, I prefer to have it in the MIPS channel to be more transparent with answers and get um, more transparency towards all the decisions that were made. But if you do feel the need to DM me, I am open for that. Cool. All right. So moving forward, uh, yeah, that's about it for some of the governance stuff. Uh, let me just, one person is in the waiting room. Join. All right, cool. So uh, some, uh, I only saw one uh, integrations update this week, which was uh, DeFi Saver. So those guys are super on point. Uh, you know, we added, uh, the Maker Protocol added WBTC as a collateral type recently, and now DeFi Saver uh, supports it uh, completely. Uh, so yeah, definitely read up on this article if you're interested. Uh, but yeah, and also uh, on Tuesday, June 9th, uh, I am interested in doing kind of a special version of this community call that focuses on risk mitigation uh, tools in DeFi, specifically for vaults and, and uh, MakerDAO. Uh, so if you have any uh, great uh, pr like providers that uh, I might not know about, definitely DM me. I'm interested in having uh, you know, several of uh, these guys on the call gals on the call uh so so yeah hope hope to put together something interesting for you guys and gals uh all right so from the maker blog we uh we put out one uh interesting article this week how die became a favorite crypto in latin america uh and i definitely know a part of that is uh the infamous mariano conti uh you know, shilling die super hardcore uh in buenos aires but uh yeah feel free to read that it's a uh, really interesting read you know uh as a person you know me living in new york uh and in general like if you live anywhere and you stay there for a long time you kind of don't realize how different uh different parts of the world are uh and so in latin america the whole money situation is completely different from new york uh and so die has been helping uh a ton of communities uh, particularly like developer communities and designer communities um many freelancers uh, to get paid in something that uh, holds its value a lot better than the Ar Argentinian peso or, or even Bitcoin, right? So uh, I actually remember Mariano told the story of, you know, first it was, you know, he used to get paid in the Argentinian peso and then part of his uh, negotiation uh, of his salary was also in the US dollar. But since people couldn't access US dollars, this kind of transformed into being uh, uh, negotiated for pesos and Bitcoin. Uh, and that also was kind of a, a little bit nuanced because Bitcoin is volatile. So uh, there's a lot of weirdness in the agreement. And then now people are moving to uh, to doing agreements in pesos, uh, Argentinian pesos and DAI, uh, which is super fascinating uh, to, to see people naturally using it. And, uh, and that's exactly what DAI is for. And actually Mark uh, in the chat adds that he's paid in a DAI, which is Ave's version of DAI. Uh, inflation mitigation die and the best way to get payroll. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, so launching into some highlights from the community, uh, <clears throat> the Maker Foundation and uh, Dharma partnered together to do a die for memes campaign. Uh, you know, since we all live on the internet, we all love memes. So uh, in partnership with Dharma, uh, we, we have been awarding people uh, actually through Twitter uh, with Dharma's uh, kind of uh, gift, you know, transfer die tool that they created uh, uh, with die for memes. Yeah, so 5,000 die in total rewards uh, and each meme you post is a chance to win one to five die. Uh, so definitely uh, go participate. I think it's still running, so. Uh, I want to see good memes, man. All right, uh, another cool highlight from the community, actually our very own Mariano Conti uh, launched DeFi 18N. Uh, I don't know if that actually, see, I, I'm guilty for not reading through his site more closely, but uh, he it's a collection of translated strings with a focus on Ethereum dApps, DeFi and wallets. Uh, and so uh, kind of what, what this looks like, it's really interesting, but actually I'll show you on die stats, but uh, so he, he launched this for die stats, and so far there have been a number of uh, of, uh, of submitted translations. So uh, basically, asking people to translate key terms uh, uh, in three different uh, JSON files in these repos. 
uh, into different languages. So they're all under a Creative Commons CC uh, zero license. Uh, and the idea is to have the DeFi community, the Ethereum community, uh, have a place to draw on for kind of standard terms uh, like, you know, what does block mean in Russian? What's a stable coin in Russian? What's uh, uh, what, what is stability fee in French? You know, uh, all those kinds of things. And I think that's massively important when people align on terms. Uh, yeah, there's just way less friction. So definitely kudos to Mariano for kickstart, kickstarting yet another side project. I don't know how he, uh, how he uh, manages. Oh yeah, it is difficult. Deflation? Is that so? So Aaron Anderson uh, said he read it as deflation. Uh, maybe that's what it is. I, I gotta reread the website, but it might be right. Defi Latin or something. Defi Latin. You know what? We can we can get to the bottom of this right now. Actually. Oh. Uh, right. Yeah, Brian has it. Yeah, here it is. Decentralized finance. I eighteen N is internationalization. Ha. Huh. Obvious, obviously, guys and gals. All right, cool. So, uh, moving forward, uh, a few different, uh, I know, right? Mind blown. A few different uh, developer creations this week. Uh, so, uh, I guess I'll go from the top, but our very own integrations team actually put out uh, yet another uh, developer guide. Uh, so, how to use the permit function that's uh, inherent to, uh, to die for multi, multi collateral die. Uh, and relayers to pay gas for DAI transactions in DAI. Uh, so this is very useful for DAP developers, uh, for anybody really playing around with DAI who doesn't want their users to have to worry about having uh, ETH in their wallets. Uh, yeah. Uh, next, there is also a split protocol for DSR. So this is a project that uh, that uh, Bamsi has been working on. So Bamsi is a long time maker OG. Uh, and this is a, a really cool, uh, oh no, I guess uh, might've been uh, moved somewhere. But uh, the idea behind it is really cool. It's basically splitting up the, uh, uh, the, the principle that you deposit into the DSR with the actual interest uh, that's accruing and you're able to direct, you're able to basically tokenize the principle and then tokenize what the interest would be and uh, yeah, and, and trade it freely. So it's really uh, interesting idea. Uh, it's good for um, fixed rate uh, kind of uh, arrangements. Like there's interesting stuff you could do with this, but I won't get into it. Hopefully uh, in a community call sometime in the near future, uh, I can get Vamp on himself and he could present it. I also saw this new website uh, emerge, BTC on Ethereum. So I had no idea that there were uh, this many Bitcoins. I don't know which, you know, how many are legit and how many aren't. Like clearly WBTC we know about, don't know about HBTC, IMBTC, SBTC, you know, TBTC, yes, RENBTC, I've heard, you know, but both of these are super early. Uh, either way, pretty, pretty cool website. Uh, so I wanted to throw that in here just cause. Uh, <clears throat> some articles, oh yeah, uh, another, thing that happened this week was uh, WBTC uh, was minted like mad. Uh, I think we went from just having a couple hundred thousand uh, die generated from WBTC all the way up to, uh, to almost 10 million now. Uh, and I believe the primary uh, user of this is actually Nexo. Uh, so what they're doing is they're using <clears throat> the maker protocol as a primary uh, credit facility for for Bitcoin credit, and then they are uh, arbitraging because they actually offer uh, borrowing against Bitcoin on their own platform uh, to users from, I think between like five and 8% or something like that. So they are basically refinancing and capturing that spread between 1% and whatever they charge their users. So really interesting to see the maker protocol uh, coming alive as this kind of primary uh, credit market at least for Bitcoin for now, while the rates are uh, very competitive. All right, so so yeah, so this uh, this article is by Alex uh, 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 Svanjevic. I hope I pronounced his last name right, but he gets into basically the uh, chain analysis and uh, 
basically what happened. Yeah, he he's the one, he's the one actually who I realized was uh, who pointed out that it was Nexo, and he kind of uh, yeah outlined that in this article. So definitely worth reading. Uh, another notable thread from the forum this week uh, was a discussion on uh, the business policy of rate setting, uh, and in this uh, forum thread, uh, Primoz actually uh, wanted to outline something very clear. Uh, the idea that, uh, yeah, there's three policies that need to be considered when setting the rates. There's the monetary policy uh, to keep the die peg stable. There's a uh, risk compensation, making MKR holders uh, hedged and business policy that helps MakerDAO remain competitive, right? So those are the three things, monetary policy for stability, uh, risk premiums to, you know, uh, properly compensate maker holders, and then finally, yeah, uh, to help uh, gain market share when possible. So uh, his argument is that we should be monitoring uh, other rates for collateral on the market and that we should be mindful of kind of the delta between our rates and their rates. And uh, yeah, if, you, if you're interested in kind of the mechanics of, of like what decisions we should make based on what the rates are telling us, uh, read it. But he's basically saying when... Uh, there's a mismatch in the market when, uh, yeah, maybe I, I'm going to butcher it. So I'm, you know, I'm just going to let you guys read it. Uh, and then maybe I could better explain it uh, some other time. <sighs> All right. So a couple of videos uh, this week, uh, both from the Thursday governance call. Uh, one of them is the source card presentation that I mentioned earlier. And the, uh, the second presentation that happened in that call was around MIP15, the dark spell mechanism, uh, and it was presented by Will Barnes, uh, who is actually the author of that MIP. Uh, so yeah, definitely check those presentations out. They're super great ways to catch yourself up on these uh, matters. Uh, and speaking of source cred, there's actually a community call that's happening uh, in about an hour and 10 minutes from now, uh, today. Uh, so it's focused on Maker uh, uh, and it's uh, mainly focused on this uh, three-month trial of source cred that we're going to be doing potentially if the poll passes on the forums. So uh, join their Discord. Uh, I think if I have time, I might be in there. So yeah. And then also, uh, yeah, I mentioned this at the very beginning of the call, but I know a couple people have joined. Next week on uh, June 2nd, we're going to be transforming this community call into a DAO rush themed call where we focus a lot more heavily on the DAO and human like DAO aspect of MakerDAO. And yeah, I covered the format, but if you're interested in what it is, I'm not going to uh, go over it a second time, but you could check it out here. All right, right on. So that concludes my, uh, my coverage of the agenda. And uh, if I missed anything, definitely feel free to uh, let me know. Uh, but otherwise, uh, if you guys have any questions or uh, want to discuss anything or are curious about anything, uh, feel free to yeah jump on the mic now, hop on the chat. Uh, but otherwise, we could probably end uh, a few minutes early if there is no further discussion. All right, sweet. So thank you guys for coming. This was uh, this was a fun one, uh, and hope to see you guys uh, next Tuesday. Later, David.